award-winning social advocate, an author and broadcaster, whose February 2017 appearance on Q&A was an absolute sensation, gathering over 12 million views in under a week. Yeah. Yasmin's courageous activism on topics of race, equality and unconscious bias have brought her to the forefront of public debate in Australia, whether she likes it or not, and abroad. Her acclaimed TED talk, What Does My Headscarf Mean to You, and other public appearances have made her a globally renowned speaker and advocate. She's published a fabulous autobiography entitled Yasmin's Story, which I don't know about you, I have two young children. I don't have time to read books with my eyes anymore. I listen to everything as an audio book. And it is fabulous because Yasmin narrates it and it is fantastic to hear it in her own voice, literally. It tells the story of growing up a Sudanese Muslim woman in Australia. She's also recently created and starred in the ABC's Hijabistas, a series focused on young Muslim women breaking fashion moulds while dressing in accordance with their faith. On Anzac Day 2017, Yasmin tweeted, Lest we forget, Manus, Nauru, Syria, Palestine. Despite deleting that tweet and apologising unreservedly, she was attacked by internet trolls, tabloid newspapers and even the odd member of parliament. Yasmin refused to give in to fear mongering. And despite being personally targeted by high profile political figures through inaccurate and racist media reporting, she wouldn't be silenced. She continues to speak out against racism, discrimination, and harmful stereotypes. She continues to give voice to the experience of young Muslim women in Australia and beyond, all the while resisting the imperative to embody the model minority. After the dust had settled a bit, she said, the reality is the visceral nature of the fury. Almost every time I share a perspective or make a statement in any forum, it's more about who I am than about what I said. We came in, Liberty Victoria came in for an absolute roasting for awarding the young Voltaire to Yasmin. The Australian and Sky News in particular were in a state of frothing conniption. But all of the trolling and hate mail that we received could not possibly compare to the avalanche of vitriol that's been directed to Yasmin on a daily basis for some time now. It's a heck of a lot for anyone to deal with, let alone, let alone a relatively young person who has done nothing more or less than expressing an opinion that may be unpalatable to some. Yasmin, I think you're a superstar. You are smart, you are brave, you are a trailblazer. And sorry everyone, but that tweet was bang on the money. Yeah. <laughs> bold, but you embolden others, and you light the way for other women, other young Muslim women and women of colour to follow in your fabulous footsteps. There is absolutely no better recipient for the Young Voltaire Award than you. Welcome, Yasmin Adelante. How are we doing? Before I begin, um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather, uh, the, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I'd like to tell you why I do that. I do that because despite the fact that I'm a citizen myself on this land, I was born in Sudan, proudly Sudanese, um, hashtag African gang. <laughs> And it's, it's actually, it's great to be in a city where I know you're all afraid to be out tonight. <laughs> Everyone's afraid except Christopher Pine. Man, he missed the moment. Um, <laughs> I promise I'd be good. Um, don't be good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but in seriousness, um, I mean, I, I'm a settler to this land and it, it's always interested me that we as Australians travel around the world thousands of miles, kilometres, to see ancient civilizations, relics from the Egyptians, the Romans, the Aztecs. And yet here in Australia, we have a living civilization that is older than all of them. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, up to 85 times older 
than the oldest civilizations we go out in the world to visit. That is absolutely incredible. And yet, as a nation, we don't quite know how to deal with that. It makes us a little bit awkward. <laughs> we can't even acknowledge the fact that this country was invaded. That sends people into those sorts of conditions that we talked about earlier. And for me, acknowledgement is about just that. Acknowledging the fact that we have our very foundation, we have a lot of work to do. As a nation, we have this insecurity about who we are because our founding story is one that we have not acknowledged. And I travel around the world and I say, I say that I'm Australian, that I'm proud to be, but sometimes I wonder what that word even means. Thank you for having me back in Melbourne. It's, um, it's genuinely quite interesting for me to be back, to be honest. Uh, somebody asked me what it was like to be back recently, and I said, when I walk towards the departure gate and I hear the accent, <laughs> you can hear it. I actually felt a little nauseous, which is devastating because this is a place that I love. I moved, my family chose to move here when I was a year and a half. We were one of the first Sudanese families, the first <clears throat> gangs in Britain. <laughs> we have the colours. And um, that's definitely going to be a headline. <laughs> my dad's going to be like, I told you, keep it on the DL. And I love this country. But it's a unique feeling when the place that you love decides for whatever reason to reject you. And I thought a lot about what I, what I wanted to talk about tonight. I have a couple of minutes. And hearing the words on from Beirut honestly humbled me to tears. I am truly, genuinely humbled to be up here because I never thought, I'm, I studied mechanical engineering. I thought I was gonna be a race car driver. <laughs> I genuinely never thought that I would ever be in a position to be talking about freedom of speech or the importance of it. But something that Bainu said resonated. We don't speak because we want to win awards. We speak because we must. What is the point of freedom of speech? Some would say it's the right to offend. But for me, the point of freedom of speech is about truth. And what is the point of truth if not to fight for justice? When all the things were going on last year and I had a chat to my dad, he was like, well, at least you're not into that. We'd all be getting tortured. <laughs> and that's what you get for you know, having a top gang member as your dad. Right? Like, I'm just going to keep bringing it up. It's great. Being Sudanese has never been so in vogue. <laughs> When we moved here, people were like, where? Um, and I bring that up because I think it's fascinating that we, we're all here for an award about freedom of speech. And there are two things that I want to say about that. Number one, I feel very humbled to be up here, but there are a lot of people who can't be and whose voice is still not yet heard. And it's important that we recognise and remember that. And who's, because the, the playing field is not level. And there are still all sorts of barriers to entry as to whose speech we, de we deem worth listening to. If my accent was slightly different, if I wore a less fabulous outfit. <laughs> Let us not think that freedom of speech or free speech is actually free. And for some, that price is higher than others. Yeah. The thing that I guess I want to leave you with, and one of my favorite quotes, and you've probably all heard it, is that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. 
but I'm an engineer. Nothing changes course without some sort of external force. This arc is not bending by itself. This arc bends because of the force of people that decide to do something about it. And hopefully some of you are in this room. But it bends because of the force and the weight of people who decide that the truth is worth the truth is worth saying, but then also doing something about. And yes, change is action, and it starts with a conversation. And that's why freedom of speech needs to be protected. But I want to also add one more thing. It is that in all of this, we are not morally superior. And we need to ensure that we are listening just as much as we are talking. Because it is much easier to dehumanize those that we are trying to fight against. That is the easy way. To say that they are all of the things, racist and bigots and so on and so on. It is so much easier. It is so much more difficult to recognize their humanity disagree with them anyway, and fight for change anyway, all the while, seeing them as human. And I say this because I come from a nation where the oppressed became the oppressor. I was born in Sudan, where the people who are now in power were once the liberators, and many post-colonial nations have had this happen. We need to figure out what a model looks like where we learn to share power, not simply take it so we can do to others what has been done to us. Because historically that's what tends to happen. I don't have the answers. I'm only, I just turned 27, y'all. I'm out here living my best life. But I want to leave you with that. How do we create connections that are beyond what ideology we have? How do we humanize those who may choose to hate us? And you know what? To choose to forgive those who have done to me, what has happened? There is nothing quite like being rejected by your village and the village is the whole country. There is nothing like that. The hardest thing I've ever had to do is to choose to forgive those. But I'm telling you that it can be done. And the strength and certainty that you get from saying, I know that you hate me, but I'm going to choose to see you as human anyway, that's the most powerful of all.